Hey, AIDS 2022. Salut mes amis. En tant que Canadienne, j'étais ravie de recevoir l'invitation à vous, vous rejoindre à Montréal. Well, hi, friends. As a Canadian, uh, Heureusement, I was les happy circonstances... Uh, to get the to, uh, join you in Montreal. Unfortunately, unexpected. The situation did not allow me to be present. But I am with you in spirit. spirit. So, so, greetings from Cairo, and let's talk about HIV and the law. To begin, take a look at this. You know better than anyone that HIV brings out the best and the worst in humanity. And the laws reflect these attitudes. Now that's me, 10 years ago, giving a talk on HIV and how to fight an epidemic of bad laws. Back then, in 2012, I was vice chair of the Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Now this was an independent group of 14 distinguished figures or rather 13 of me, who came from the worlds of law and politics and development, and we were all brought together by UNDP, along with an A-team of experts to look at legal environments around the world and how they were helping or hindering the global HIV response. Now, central to the Commission's work were these groundbreaking regional dialogues that brought together 700 people from 140 countries, and these were individuals who were on the sharp ends of either making or breaking the law. Now, at the Commission, we looked at HIV and the law in all its complexity. So, there are laws and policies and practices that directly relate to people living with HIV. These are the laws, for example, that criminalize HIV transmission, exposure or non-disclosure, or HIV-related travel restrictions. Then there's a whole set of laws which target key populations. LGBTIQ individuals, sex workers, people who use drugs, people on the move, migrants and refugees, and people who can't move at all, prisoners. Now, these laws can be indirect, like those that touch on sexual and reproductive health and rights, abortion, for example, or gender-based violence, or they can be laws that impact civil society. There are also laws which affect access to health care and medicines and diagnostics and vaccines. For example, intellectual property rights or policies on health care coverage. Now, laws can be broad or they can be specific. So laws that penalize HIV transmission can be based on wide ranging laws that relate to assault or they can be very targeted and single out HIV. Laws can be general, they can be customary, or they can come from religious codes. And it's not just laws on the books we're talking about, legislation, legal codes, but also laws in practice. How judges and prosecutors and lawyers and police enforce the law. Alas, the law is not the same for everyone. Even among people living with HIV or key populations, some are more vulnerable before the law than others. Women, youth, people of color, people who are economically disadvantaged, people with disabilities, and other marginalized groups. And we know that these vulnerabilities intersect. By the same token, these laws and policies, they're not silos either. They too connect. Now, when we have laws that respect and protect they form a safety net, and it's woven out of fundamental human rights, and this net supports our individual and collective responses to HIV. But you know, when these laws punish or deny or restrict, this becomes a spider's web, and it's spun out of inequalities, and it's a trap of stigma and discrimination. Now, the conference organizers have kindly invited me to talk about tackling discriminatory and ineffective laws. That's a very delicate wording. Because what we're talking about when we look at this web of HIV and the law are not just discriminatory, but frankly punitive laws. And far from being ineffective, these laws are actually extremely powerful at ruining people's lives and sabotaging global efforts to respond to HIV. Now, back at the Commission, we issued a set of no-holds-barred recommendations on how this web of laws could be transformed from a trap 
into a trampoline, springboarding us to the SDGs and, in particular, to ending HIV as a public health threat by 2030. So here I am, 10 years later, again talking about HIV and the law. It's the same suit. It's the same hair. I mean, it's the same shoes. But the question here is, is it the same story? Well, no. And also, yes. So let me explain. Since the Global Commission and all the follow-up it catalyzed around the world, there has been a wide-ranging recognition that the law is as much a tool in our global efforts on HIV as any self-test or condom or ARV. Now, this is reflected in a couple of key developments over the past decade. The first is evidence. Thanks to greater attention to and assessment of legal environments, we now have a much better picture of exactly what laws related to HIV are on the books in jurisdictions around the world and how they are being used to either infringe or enforce the rights of people living with HIV and those at risk. For example, let's take a look at the laws on HIV transmission. Back in 2012, we thought that 54 countries had laws that specifically criminalized HIV transmission, exposure, or non-disclosure. At the time, we thought that 59 countries did not have such laws, and in 79 countries, we actually didn't know what the legal situation was. Now, if we fast forward to today and the latest numbers in the Global AIDS update, those figures look very different. 93 countries have laws that explicitly criminalize HIV. Another 41 are prosecuting on the basis of more general laws, and 52 don't have these laws at all. Now, it's not the case that, you know, around 80 countries decided to introduce these laws over the past decade. Quite the contrary, in fact, because we've seen some remarkable repeals. The change is that we now have a clearer picture of legal landscapes and what is happening in those almost 80 black boxes from a decade ago. In addition to this, not just knowing what the laws are, we have a much better idea of the impact of these laws on access to prevention, testing, and treatment. So, a few examples. In a selection of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, gay men and other men who have sex with men living in places where there are severe criminal penalties for same-sex sexual relations have an almost five times higher risk of HIV infection than those living in places without such laws. We know now that repressive policing practices are estimated to double female sex workers' risk of contracting HIV or other STIs. We now know that criminalization of drug use is associated with a 14% decrease in knowledge of HIV status and in viral suppression. And in countries where the age of consent for HIV testing is 15 or less, rates of testing are 74% higher than in countries where the age of consent is 16 or above. In addition to this evidence, there's also the science. Advances in testing and prevention and treatment make a complete nonsense of laws and policies that seek to protect communities by criminalizing unintentional HIV transmission or those at risk of HIV. Let's face it, when undetectable equals untransmittable, then a law that is unscientific is unnecessary. And if such a law is also unjust, it is untenable. And that law needs to be undone. Since the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, there have been a whole host of international strategies and processes and agreements that have given prominence, but also power to this new understanding of the role of the law when it comes to HIV. Among them is the Global AIDS Strategy and the Political Declaration on HIV AIDS, which UN member states have adopted and to which they will be held accountable. At the heart of these landmark documents are the 10, 10, 10 targets. By 2025, less than 10% of countries have punitive laws and policies. 
Less than 10% of people living with HIV in key populations experience stigma and discrimination. And less than 10% of people living with HIV, women and girls and key populations experience gender inequalities and sexual and gender-based violence. Now, these 10-10-10 targets are conceivable thanks to what is arguably the biggest change we've seen over the past decade, the democratization of the law. Here's what I said back in 2012. For many of us here, HIV is not an abstract threat. It hits very close to home. The law, on the other hand, can seem remote, arcane, the stuff of specialists. But it isn't. Because for those of us who live in democracies, or in aspiring democracies, the law begins with us. Ten years on, it's clear that you, our friends in civil society, have taken all this to heart. You now know the letter of the law, and you have the wherewithal to challenge bad laws and help craft better ones. You know how to lobby in parliaments or litigate in the courts. And you know enough to just say no when the long arm of the law comes and tries to put you down. Now, social media has amplified your access to information and your ability to act on it. And your word increasingly carries as much weight as any other evidence as to whether a law should rise or fall. You know what's interesting? It's not just lawbreakers today who are different, it's lawmakers as well. Like, think about the judges' forums and the parliamentarian networks and the prosecutor trainings and the law enforcement workshops that have sprung up all over the world. These are safe spaces for duty bearers to meet people living with HIV and those at risk and to really understand the human face of the laws that they create and uphold. This is a safe space for them to exchange with their peers and to find the courage to challenge the status quo. As a result of all this, in the past five years alone, we've seen dozens of countries reform their laws, like Zimbabwe, that amended its HIV transmission legislation just this year or Botswana that has decriminalized same-sex sexual acts. Hello Belgium, which has recently decriminalized sex work. Thank you New Zealand that has lifted visa restrictions for people living with HIV. Grand merci au Canada. Thank you my home country that is in the process of decriminalizing personal drug use or possession. Thanks also to Vietnam that has reduced the age of parental consent for young people to access HIV testing or services. And last but not least, Uruguay, who, that has introduced legal protection for transgender persons. The problem is that we still have a very long way to go. Laws on sex work, for example, have barely budged over the past decade. And when they have, like criminalizing clients or third parties instead of sex workers themselves, the impact has not been for the better. Progress has also been very slow on drug decriminalization. And then there has been some alarming backsliding from the overturning of Roe versus Wade in the US to Poland's increased maximum sentencing in the case of HIV exposure, or Kenya's high court, which has resisted appeals to decriminalize same-sex sexual acts between consenting adults. All of this brings me to a pressing concern. Take a look at this analysis from the HIV Policy Lab on how regions around the world fare according to how closely their structural policies, which include all the laws that we've been talking about, align with international best practice. On the left are regions that are least compliant with international standards, and on the right are those that are closest to these global benchmarks. Now take a look at how these regions rank according to their democratic credentials. On the left are more authoritarian regimes, and on the right, more democratic ones. Not surprisingly, these rankings line up. And that is a huge challenge. Because all the tools I've mentioned for legal change when it comes to HIV are designed to fix more or less democratic machinery. But what do you do when your parliament doesn't have any power? And your judiciary is far from independent. 
and your media is a million miles from free. What do you do when law enforcement serves the state, not the people, and civil society has little, if any, room to maneuver? What do you do when HIV, the epidemic, is concentrated, and therefore it's easy for those in power to overlook? Welcome to my world. As director for the Middle East and North Africa at UNAIDS, my colleagues and I are working in some of the toughest terrains on the planet for human rights in general and those related to HIV in particular. Now, here are the global averages for countries criminalizing or protecting people living with HIV and key populations. And here is the average for countries in MENA. As you can see, countries across our region criminalize just about everything. Now, these laws are both a mirror but also a motor of rampant stigma and discrimination. And this is a big part of why we have seen a 33% rise in new HIV infections in MENA over the past decade, and why we have the lowest rates of testing, treatment, and viral suppression in the world. I have a real concern that in the event that the world does reach the 10-10-10 targets, MENA is going to be the 10% that gets left behind. That being said, we are neither hopeless nor helpless when it comes to HIV and the law. We have ways of massaging and manipulating and maneuvering around the law to advance our HIV response. So here are a few tips for change in challenging legal environments. There's a lot of talk about trying to pluck the low-hanging fruit when it comes to legal change. Well, to be blunt here in MENA, we are hunting for root vegetables. Forget the tough stuff, anything to do with sex, frankly, and start with the areas that are marginally easier, like HIV-related travel restrictions. It's important to get the wheels of justice grinding, however slowly, and to have the patience to let the process take its time. Elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV or HIV-related stigma and discrimination are relatively uncontroversial issues, even in highly conservative settings. Programs like the WHO's triple certification of EMTCT for HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B, or the Global Partnership for Action to Eliminate All Forms of HIV-Related Stigma and Discrimination, are not only socially and politically acceptable, but within them is the requirement to review and by extension act, on all the laws and policies that we've been talking about. They are, in effect, Trojan horses for legal reform, and they should be rolled out to maximum effect. Now, while we would prefer to ground legal reform in the bedrock of human rights, it can be more fruitful to plant the seed of change in the topsoil of political opportunism like a leader wanting to look progressive in front of international peers, or to signal a break with the past by undoing colonial-era laws, or to impress donors, or to burnish the national image as a trailblazer, or to connect to high-profile initiatives like universal health coverage or social protection. It's very important to keep an eye out for this bigger picture as an opportunity for change. In a few countries in MENA, we don't have explicit laws that criminalize, say, same-sex relations or HIV transmission. But trying to introduce protective legislation or repeal existing laws can open up a Pandora's box of debate that is too easily hijacked by political interests, and you can actually find yourself with worse laws than when you started. So it's better to focus on lessening the blow of bad laws and realizing the potential of good ones by putting your scarce resources into implementation, police training or prosecutor guidelines or judicial dialogues. Shifting the law in practice is just as important as amending it on paper. Even on the Global Commission, we struggled with how to engage with religious jurisprudence and how to balance our recommendations for reform with the reality of how law plays out in faith-based cultures. Too often, authoritarian leaders use religious opposition as an excuse to do nothing, or worse. In these settings, our best laid plans for decriminalization will never be realized unless we are flexible enough 
to truly listen to what religious voices are telling us and to collectively find a balance between the needs of the flesh and the demands of the faith. Now, I'm sorry to say that these tactics that we've been honing in the Middle East and North Africa are increasingly relevant elsewhere, too, as COVID and other emerging pandemics, economic crises, populism, digital surveillance on the dark side of the social media are pumping up patriarchies and shrinking civic space around the world. If we've learned anything since the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, it's that the road to 2030 is full of U-turns and speed bumps and detours and emergency stops. And so I'll end my talk today as I did 10 years ago. And should I have the good fortune to be with you in person, we'll do so 10 years from now. Laws that treat people living with HIV or those at greatest risk with respect start with the way that we treat them ourselves as equals. If we are going to stop the spread of HIV in our lifetime, then that is the change that we need to spread. I want to thank you all for your attention today, and I wish you a safe and successful AIDS 2022.